Recording by Ruth Golding. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Translated by Eleanor Marks Aveling. Part One, Chapter Six. She had read Paul and Virginia, and she had dreamt of the little bamboo house, the nigger Domingo, the dog Fiddle, but above all of the sweet friendship of some dear little brother who seeks red fruit for you on trees taller than steeples, or who runs barefoot over the sand, bringing you a bird's nest. When she was thirteen, her father himself took her to town to place her in the convent. They stopped at an inn in the Saint-Gervais quarter, where at their supper they used painted plates that set forth the story of Mademoiselle de la Vallière. The explanatory legends, chipped here and there by the scratching of knives, all glorified religion, the tendernesses of the heart, and the pomps of court. Far from being bored at first at the convent, she took pleasure in the society of the good sisters, who, to amuse her, took her to the chapel, which one entered from the refectory by a long corridor. She played very little during recreation hours knew her catechism well, and it was she who always answered Monsieur le Vicaire's difficult questions. Living thus, without ever leaving the warm atmosphere of the classrooms, and amid these pale-faced women wearing rosaries with brass crosses, she was softly lulled by the mystic languor exhaled in the perfumes of the altar, the freshness of the holy water, and the lights of the tapers. Instead of attending to Mass, she looked at the pious vignette, with their azure borders in her book, and she loved the sick lamb, the sacred heart pierced with sharp arrows, or the poor Jesus sinking beneath the cross he carries. She tried, by way of mortification, to eat nothing a whole day. She puzzled her head to find some vow to fulfil. When she went to confession, she invented little sins, in order that she might stay there longer, kneeling in the shadow, her hands joined, her face against the grating beneath the whispering of the priest. The comparisons of betrothed, husband, celestial lover, and eternal marriage that recur in sermons stirred within her soul depths of unexpected sweetness. In the evening, before prayers, there was some religious reading in the study. On weeknights it was some abstract of sacred history, or the lectures of the Abbe Fraissinou, and on Sundays passages from the Génie du Christianisme as a recreation. How she listened at first to the sonorous lamentations of its romantic melancholies, re-echoing through the world and eternity! If her childhood had been spent in the shop-parlour of some business quarter, she might perhaps have opened her heart to those lyrical invasions of nature, which usually come to us only through translation in books. But she knew the country too well. She knew the lowing of cattle, the milking, the ploughs. Accustomed to calm aspects of life, she turned, on the contrary, to those of excitement. She loved the sea only for the sake of its storms, and the green fields only when broken up by ruins. She wanted to get some personal profit out of things, and she rejected as useless all that did not contribute to the immediate desires of her heart, being of a temperament more sentimental than artistic, looking for emotions, not landscapes. At the convent there was an old maid who came for a week each month to mend the linen. Patronised by the clergy, because she belonged to an ancient family of noblemen ruined by the revolution, she dined in the refectory at the table of the good sisters, and after the meal had a bit of chat with them before going back to her work. The girls often slipped out from the study to go and see her. She knew by heart the love-songs of the last century, and sang them in a low voice as she stitched away. 
She told stories, gave them news, went errands in the town, and on the sly lent the big girls some novel that she always carried in the pockets of her apron, and of which the good lady herself swallowed long chapters in the intervals of her work. They were all love, lovers, sweethearts, persecuted ladies fainting in lonely pavilions, postillions killed at every stage, horses ridden to death on every page, sombre forests, heartaches, vows, sobs, tears and kisses, little skiffs by moonlight, nightingales in shady groves, gentlemen, brave as lions, gentle as lambs, virtuous as no one ever was, always well dressed and weeping like fountains. For six months, then, Emma, at fifteen years of age, made her hands dirty with books from old lending libraries. Through Walter Scott, later on, she fell in love with historical events, dreamed of old chests, guard-rooms, and minstrels. She would have liked to live in some old manor-house, like those long-waisted chatelaine who, in the shade of pointed arches, spent their days leaning on the stone, chin in hand, watching a cavalier with white plume galloping on his black horse from the distant fields. At this time she had a cult for Mary Stuart, and enthusiastic veneration for illustrious or unhappy women. Joan of Arc, Eloise, Agnès Sorel, the beautiful Ferronière, and Clémence Isor stood out to her like comets in the dark immensity of heaven where also were seen, lost in shadow and all unconnected, Saint-Louis with his oak, the dying Bayard, some cruelties of Louis XI, a little of St. Bartholomew's Day, the plume of the Béarnais, and always the remembrance of the plates painted in honour of Louis XIV. In the music class, in the ballads she sang, there was nothing but little angels with golden wings, madonnas, lagoons, gondoliers, mild compositions that allowed her to catch a glimpse athwart the obscurity of style and the weakness of the music, of the attractive phantasmagoria of sentimental realities. Some of her companions brought keepsakes, given them as New Year's gifts, to the convent. These had to be hidden. It was quite an undertaking. They were read in the dormitory. Delicately handling the beautiful satin bindings, Emma looked with dazzled eyes at the names of the unknown authors, who had signed their verses for the most part as counts or viscounts. She trembled as she blew back the tissue paper over the engraving, and saw it folded in two and fall gently against the page. Here, behind the balustrade of a balcony, was a young man in a short cloak, holding in his arms a young girl in a white dress, wearing an arms-bag at her belt. Or there were nameless portraits of English ladies with fair curls, who looked at you from under their round straw hats, with their large, clear eyes. Some there were lounging in their carriages, gliding through parks a greyhound bounding along in front of the equipage driven at a trot by two midget postilions in white breeches. Others, dreaming on sofas with an open letter, gazed at the moon through a slightly open window half draped by a black curtain. The naive ones, a tear on their cheeks, were kissing doves through the bars of a gothic cage, or, smiling, their heads on one side were plucking the leaves of a marguerite with their taper fingers that curved at the tips like peaked shoes. And you, too, were there, sultans with long pipes reclining beneath arbours in the arms of Bayadere, Djur, Turkish sabres, Greek caps, and you especially, pale landscapes of dithyrambic lands that often show us at once palm-trees and firs, tigers on the right, a lion to the left, 
Tartar minarets on the horizon, the whole framed by a very neat virgin forest, and with a great perpendicular sunbeam trembling in the water, where, standing out in relief, like white excoriations on a steel-grey ground, swans are swimming about. And the shade of the argand lamp fastened to the wall above Emma's head lighted up all these pictures of the world that passed before her one by one in the silence of the dormitory, and to the distant noise of some belated carriage rolling over the boulevards. When her mother died, she cried much the first few days. She had a funeral picture made with the hair of the deceased, and in a letter sent to the Berthaud, full of sad reflections on life, she asked to be buried later on in the same grave. The good man thought she must be ill, and came to see her. Emma was secretly pleased that she had reached at a first attempt the rare ideal of pale lives, never attained by mediocre hearts. She let herself glide along with Lamartine meanderings, listened to harps on lakes, to all the songs of dying swans, to the falling of the leaves, the pure virgins ascending to heaven, and the voice of the Eternal discoursing down the valleys. She wearied of it, would not confess it, continued from habit, and at last was surprised to feel herself soothed, and with no more sadness at heart than wrinkles on her brow. The good nuns, who had been so sure of her vocation, perceived with great astonishment that Mademoiselle Rouault seemed to be slipping from them. They had indeed been so lavish to her of prayers, retreats, novenas, and sermons, they had so often preached the respect due to saints and martyrs, and given so much good advice as to the modesty of the body and the salvation of her soul, that she did as tightly reined horses. She pulled up short, and the bit slipped from her teeth. This nature, positive in the midst of its enthusiasms, that had loved the church for the sake of the flowers, and music for the words of the songs, and literature for its passional stimulus, rebelled against the mysteries of faith as it grew irritated by discipline, a thing antipathetic to her constitution. When her father took her from school, no one was sorry to see her go. The Lady Superior even thought that she had latterly been somewhat irreverent to the community. Emma, at home once more, first took pleasure in looking after the servants, then grew disgusted with the country, and missed her convent. When Charles came to the Berthaud for the first time, she thought herself quite disillusioned, with nothing more to learn, and nothing more to feel. But the uneasiness of her new position or perhaps the disturbance caused by the presence of this man, had sufficed to make her believe that she at last felt that wondrous passion, which till then, like a great bird with rose-coloured wings, hung in the splendour of the skies of poesy. And now she could not think that the calm in which she lived was the happiness she had dreamed. End of Part One, Chapter Six. Recording by Ruth Golding.